two, three. Okay. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, another uh, Holland Chandler Leadership Series. Thank you for taking time out of uh, your busy week to spend time with us on a Wednesday to talk about very important topics here in the Charlotte area. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my wing person, uh, Shannon, here today. She's uh, handling some personal things today. And so I have to kind of read the spiel myself. I won't go into the spiel about myself, you know, because I can't really talk about yourself. That's what a wing person's there for, right? That's how cool the host is. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip that out and you'll kind of know who I am, but I can, I, I do need to give a plug for our sponsor, which is the law firm of Hull and Chandler. Hull and Chandler is a client centered law firm providing legal services to individuals, families, businesses, and nonprofits here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and throughout the Carolinas. Our award-winning attorneys help out clients resolve problems and find solutions. Our firm specializes in business and contract law, employment law, civil litigation, estates, wills, trust, personal injury, commercial real estate, and lending law, and now, of course, nonprofit and public charity law. If interested in learning more about how our attorneys can help you solve your real world problems, visit our website at www.hullandchandler.com and schedule consultation with one of our award winning attorneys. Um, our law firm is proud to sponsor the Leadership Series uh, program, which is hosted by me, uh, Rocky Cabagna, where I interview local and regional leaders in the nonprofit, private, and public sectors to discuss the real-world interplay of law, business, and social dynamics within the context of our continuously changing times. Um, a little bit about me, I am the helm of the nonprofit and public charity law practice here at Hull and Chandler. Um, I had a little bit of background in the nonprofit sector, uh, much like our, our guest today, I did serve as an executive director at a public charity for a couple years. Realized that was the hardest job in America and decided to return to practicing law uh, a little after two years after um, running a, a big 501c3. And so um, I have a huge amount of respect for those who work in the nonprofit in the social sector and especially those who choose that and heed that calling of being an executive director of a nonprofit 501c3 public charity. Um, so anyway, we're here today to talk a little bit about um, the nonprofit sector, of course, and especially to talk about um, science and science funding. And of course, one of the uh, greatest treasures that we have here in the Charlotte region, the Carolina's Raptor Center. So um, without further ado, joining us today to talk about uh, the Carolina Raptor Center, some of its new um, uh, adven new adventures, new uh, new initiatives such as the Quest, and of course a little bit about science funding here in in Charlotte, particularly for nonprofits dedicated to to the sciences. And so I'd like to welcome Jim Warren from the Carolina Raptor Center. Thank you. I need I need an audience card. I keep telling Janet we need like the yeah we need the big uh, you know. Like uh, at least tan noise, you know, kind of like Laverne Shirley or something, just kind of ah, you know, <laughs> come in or something like that. So anyway, I think you and I had just talked about uh, our our common friend Pat McDowell and uh, and in his podcast, you'll be appearing on relatively soon, uh, called Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. But I always stole this, uh, and I, and it's funny because I had him on last week, um, so I got to ask him. But really, before we get into our our discussion today about the Raptor Center and and, and, and just general science funding for nonprofits in the Charlotte region. Tell us a little bit about you, Jim, because I know a lot of folks have probably been to the Raptor Center, but, and they may have met you before, particularly those who are in the, in the nonprofit sector, but not everybody gets to know a little bit about what exactly was your path to nonprofit leadership being in your position now as executive director. So tell us a little bit about your path. Well, Rocky, first, thank you for having me. And I want to thank everyone that's joining us. And I like to say you must have definitely not had anything to do today of importance if you're sitting here watching me right now, but all joking aside, you know, I started uh, in the nonprofit field when I was in college. I worked for the YMCA as a camp counselor, um, came out of school with a business degree and a recreation degree, went to work as a YMCA professional in 1981. So I'm celebrating my 40th year uh, in nonprofit work and spent a number of years with the YMCA of Greater Charlotte, uh, everything from a sports director to a program director to aquatics director, taught aerobics classes, fitness, all of that. Uh, and then I spent some time doing outdoor education. I worked for a company called Charlotte Outdoor Adventure Center. Think of uh, 
sort of Knowles meets uh, Outward Bound. We did mm -hmm. leadership development. We built ropes courses and challenge courses. And I did that for several years. Uh, went back to the YMCA and uh, the aquatics programs uh, at the Harris YMCA. Left the Y and went to work for Mecklenburg County Park and Rec. I was with Park and Rec for a number of years. I was there. Uh, aquatic program director. I opened what is now the Mecklenburg uh, County Aquatic Center down on McDowell Street. Down okay. There. Opened that facility back in the early 90s and I stayed with the county for a long time and then went back to work for the YMCA and, and was an associate exec at the McCrory branch and did that for a number of years. Went down to South Carolina and was with the YMCA down there, the Upper Palmetto YMCA, uh, and decided that in my sort of late 40s, early 50s, I was ready for a little bit more of a career change, something a little different. And at the time, Alan Barnhart was the executive director out here. And he was changing the way the organization was structured and the board was changing it. And so a little over 15 years ago, I joined the team uh, in 2006 uh, here at the Raptor Center and never looked back. Was the director of operations for a number of years. Um, served as the interim executive director for two different uh, folks, and then about I guess eleven years ago became the executive director. Okay. Well, I know that uh, you shared with me when we met out at Quest, and we're gonna, I think everyone's going to get to learn a little bit about Quest um, later on in, in today's episode. But uh, you told me a, a great origin story for the Raptor Center. I think. You know, a lot of folks know that it's like, well, you're driving a lot of plantation and, and there's a Raptor Center and you almost feel like it's always been there. Like it's it's almost almost how I feel about like the zoo in Ashburn. I feel like it's just it's just always been there. Right. And and everybody may feel the same way about the Raptor Center, but the Raptor Center hasn't always been there. And so maybe get us a little bit of the origins of, of the Carolina Raptor Center. Well, I'd love to share the history. and It is a very exciting and so if you've been out here to Atlanta Nature Preserve, you know we were, we're out here. Uh, we've been here since 1984. That's when we moved. But we truly were hatched, if you want to use sort of the bird analogy, at UNC Charlotte back in 1975. Um, Dr. Dick Brown, who was our founder, was a biology professor there. And just sheer by happenstance, treated an injured hawk, a broadwing hawk to be specific, that had been shot. And he treated it got it better, and released it. And we all know that back in the 70s, there was no internet. There was nothing that you could Google, raptor, rehab, where do I go? So just truly by word of mouth for a number of years, birds got brought to Dr. Brown. And so he sort of uh, elicited the help from some grad students and some other students. He worked with Dr. Werner uh, Case at um, Davidson College, got some Davidson students involved. And so from 75 to 84, we were doing things at the university in the basement of the old science building, just taking care of birds um, here and there. And Dick realized that the program was going to be much bigger. We needed space. Uh, the university, of course, was growing rapidly in the late 70s, early 80s. And so he was able to have us move out here into our original campus of 57 uh, and a third acres here at LATA. We have a 99-year lease for a dollar a year, thanks to the generosity of Mecklenburg County. And we've partnered with Mecklenburg County Park and Rec ever since. Uh, I asked Dick, how did we end up at Latta, right? It's the perfect place for us to be. And he then shared with me that um, he was on the task force that identified this property as a nature preserve. Mm. So he knew what the county had. He knew the opportunity that was here. And he approached the county in 83, 84, and said, we'd love to move our facility out here. We had been incorporated as a nonprofit in the early 80s. We were independent. And so the county gave us the land. And I like to share with people when you've been out here now, you know that we've got two main buildings and miles of trail and all these bird enclosures. None of that was here. The county didn't give us any of that. It was bare woods that we came in over the last almost you know, 40 some odd years and, and built out what we have here. Uh, and we're very proud of that. That's fantastic. So, I mean, in, in many ways, the and and for those of you who are either in the nonprofit sectors, it's just interesting to know kind of like the origins of where things started. So it's not like for maybe like the first five years of the Raptor Center's existence, it wasn't even an incorporated entity. Because a lot of folks are like, oh, what do I got to do? I got to file some paperwork and I got to do these articles and with these bylaws. It's not like you, that the, the origins of the Raptor Center just sort of started out like an underground 
I guess, avian hospital. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. We were sort of this covert operation. University. Dick kind of did his own thing. I'll share this story and, and folks at the university will probably say, oh no, that's not. So we had a vulture <laughs> named Campbell. Okay. And Campbell, and vultures are extremely smart. I mean, they're highly yeah. intelligent. Birds. And this bird realized it could open its enclosure down in the basement of the biology building and learn how to ride the elevator. And so Campbell would roam around the science building and that was really neat if you were part of the Raptor Center team, but not so much if you were some of the other faculty and, and staff and, and students. And so that's one of the reasons that we were asked to move is that some of the birds, and then again, we have to rehab the birds. And so we want to get them ready for flight and get them back in shape. We have beautiful hundred and plus foot enclosures now that we can train these birds in. Well, we didn't have it back yeah. in Charlotte. And so you're just flying them down the hall then. Maybe. Flying them down the hall, right? So <laughs> if you can imagine coming out of a lab and getting a face full of owl. So yeah. again, we had, we sort of had outstayed our welcome at the university. I will say that even now into his, I guess Dick's in his early 80s, is still teaching. He is still mm. teaching. He's at a small school in Tennessee, but we stay in touch. Very vibrant man. Um, and we credit him with, with all things where we are today. Yeah, Dr. Brown and, and, and a vulture named Campbell. Just yeah. remember that. Like the, legendary, the legendary characters involved with the, the story of the Raptor Center. So the Raptor Center, you moved to a, to a lot of plantation. And just as a, and I, I, although you didn't bring this up, obviously a lot of plantation has been in the news, but we could definitively say that the Carolina Raptor Center has, while it is located at technically a lot, it has nothing to do with the nonprofit that, you know, obviously, uh, has had some issues with the, the general body politic over the last weekend or so. And I guess now um, the, the county has kind of shut down operations indefinitely there. But for those of you who may be like, well, what's their relationship? There is no relationship. So I'm just going to put that out there for you. Kind of if you were even thinking, if they even kind of, you know, because a lot of plantation probably has a kind of a, a loaded kind of connotation these days, you know, just just saying the term out there. But but uh, the Raptor Center, like, as you said, is, is more or less a tenant out there, kind of like the other nonprofit is or was or is or, or so, and and have an entirely different a, a different mission. Um, so the Raptor Center um, started, it, so obviously from its origins, and it moved a lot of plantation. But like you said, a lot of it was just wilderness, it sounds like. What, so tell us about the process, because if anybody who's been to the Raptor Center now, I mean, it's a pretty... I mean, the, there's original Raptor Center, and obviously we'll get into, like, the new Raptor Center. They're all very landscaped and sophisticated, you know, um, property. How did – tell us how, you know, if you were just started off as a, uh, you know, sort of an underground avian hospital, UNCC, how – at least particularly from a money and, and, and support standpoint, how did you get to where you are now? Uh, another great question. And, again, it's all about Dick Brown. And, again, we had no staff until the late 80s. All these okay. folks doing this were volunteers. Even though we were an incorporated nonprofit, um, it was all staff. It was all volunteer driven. It, was, it wasn't until the late 80s that we actually were hiring our first staff. But Dick realized very early on that we needed support. And so he was getting some support at that point from the county. Uh, also funders. Uh, we were doing some fundraising. Uh, we were starting to do programs. We, at this point, had birds that could not be released, and so we were using those birds as our avian ambassadors, just as we do today. Um, we started building out the trail uh, as we had birds that couldn't be released, and so we had display birds, and so we started charging admission. So we started realizing that we needed revenue sources because, as we tell mm -hmm. folks, none of our birds that come in, the wild birds for treatment, are part of the Affordable Care Act. There's no Obamacare for our <laughs> birds. You know, we can't send Blue Cross Blue Shield. Bird care for all. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So all the, and we see a thousand plus birds a year in the hospital. We're the largest raptor hospital in the United States by number of patients admitted. So we have to generate revenue to cover the cost of the medical. Wow. Let me just stop you. So we are, we have in Charlotte, we have the largest in the entire nation. Cause I mean, you know, there's a lot of other states. We have the largest sort of raptor hospital, I mean, in the entire country. Yeah, by the number of patients. There's some that are bigger budget-wise, there's some that are bigger staff-wise, but as far as number mm -hmm. of patients served, we see more than a lot of them. Um, and so, you know, Dr. Brown was doing everything he could. There was no 
infrastructure. We didn't even have a well at that time. We were, staff were working out of tents. Uh, <laughs> seriously, out of tents. There was no well. So what they would do is take buckets, go to the end of Sample Road, which dead ends in the Mountain Island Lake, and they would fill buckets full of water and bring them back up to the center. Um, then we were able to get some old mobile home trailers donated. We worked out of there. If you've been to the current visitor center, you know behind us there's like a log cabin. Well, that was the original visitor center. Um, wow. And so we were using that. In 93, we opened what is now the uh, Moretti Education Center, our visitor center. And then in the late 90s, we opened what is the Jim Arthur Medical Center. So we opened our two buildings. And the mm -hmm. trail just kind of got added as we had birth. Right, we'd have we'd stop and we'd add more birds. It's like a neighborhood. We keep adding trail out through the woods as we got more birds, either on the medical side for treatment or on the public side for display. And we just sort of grown it over time. Um, yeah. Well, let's go back to like the to the late eighties there, because so that's when you first got staff. Because I think for a lot of folks who are starting nonprofits or, or interested in that, it's just. Who are your, you know, who are your funding base? Obviously, you moved into admissions because at a certain point it, it became uh, aware that, wait a second, you know, we could charge a price for folks to enjoy the education that, that we're providing them. But because obviously I'm kind of sort of foreshadowing the discussion of funding for sciences in the area. But who were your initial funders aside from the county? Because obviously the county has going to have and, and, and has that relationship with the county, have they been a steadfast funder? Or there some, some years they're on, some years they're off, or, or, or is it they're just happy to get the dollar a year lease from you and, and they don't want to hear from you? <laughs> well, and, and the financial funding really ended fairly early on. Uh, mm -hmm. At this point, we don't get any financial support. Directly. Gotcha. Um, they do give us a tremendous amount of support as a partner, of course. Yeah, the intern, um, yeah. We don't get any operating support from the county. Um, you know, we, we started at some point in the, I believe it's more into the 90s, we started getting Arts and Science Council. We were part of their mm -hmm. initiative, so we did some ASC funding. There's some state grants uh, for science education, uh, mm -hmm. now called the North Carolina Science Museums Grant Program. It comes out of the General mm -hmm. Assembly. We were able to get some of that funding. Duke Energy, some of the larger corporations, of course, were supporting what we did even back that far. Uh, but a lot of it's just individual donors. Mm -hmm. So would you say so would you say that the bulk of the revenue that you've been able to support yourself is more through um, I guess for lack of a better term more of the entrepreneurial type of I mean related to mission of course so does the admission and things related to like merch and things of that nature um or is, is, would that be the highest is that the biggest way that you're able to kind of support yourself is just folks showing up even now I think we're probably 60 percent contributed with okay. grants. grants fall into that. Yeah. And then probably 40, as folks would like to say, generated. So uh -huh. fees, program fees, seventh seminar, merchandise, gift shop, all of that's probably about 40%. Uh, we're going to, we'll grow as Quest opens. We'll have uh -huh. more visitors. Our gift shop will be bigger. Um, but contributed still, and again, that's individuals, uh -huh. that's corporations, that's foundations, that's state and federal yeah. grants. We have gotten some federal grants in the past. How was, um, so how about this? So I think like where we are now, so we, we kind of got a little bit of history, but let's talk about the current state of the Raptor Center. So here's your chance to kind of give us sort of the website or brochure um, kind of description. For, so those of us who have either not been to the Raptor Center, how would you explain the Raptor Center to somebody who just, just got off the plane at Charlotte Douglas and goes, where should I go? And I say, you should go to the Raptor Center. And here to tell you, it is Jim. So, Jim, here you are. Tell, tell this person from out of town what this rap is about. I think it'll be the coolest, most unique destination you'll see in Charlotte. And I know that's going up against a lot of other cool places to go as you see the list of attractions. Um, we're a bird zoo, right? You can come see birds that you're not going to just see here in your backyard or wherever you're from. We've got birds that are, that are international. I was just telling Rocky before we went live is we just now have some birds from Africa, uh, East African gray crowned cranes. So you need to, Rocky, put that in the chat or somebody look it up. East African gray crowned cranes. Unbelievable species of bird. Remarkable. You need to come see them. We've got some Abyssinian ground hornbills, another species of bird that you would find in Africa. We've got birds from South America, Central America, Europe, Asia, the birds from the world around. You can come see these birds as part of our admission. 
we do programs. And so you can, we can go to your school, you can come to us, we go to corporations, take birds, do formal uh, STEM-based programs is the other. And then we're a hospital, right? We are a Raptor Medical Center. We're a training mm-hmm. hospital. So vet students come and train with us. Um, we work on any number of patients a year, even during COVID, which was one of our slower years, we still did almost 700 patients and we were closed for a couple months to new patients. But again, mm-hmm. an average year for the hospital is about a thousand. Um, so you can see birds on display that you'd have to travel around the world or maybe not even found in, in very few locations in the country. Um, see a program, see birds flying. We fly our birds. So you're not just gonna see them in an enclosure. They're gonna right over your head. Um, we do professional development for all sort of folks. And so a little bit of everything, three-legged stool, right? So the visitation, the admission piece, uh, the programmatic, the STEM-based education, and then the clinic, uh, taking care of birds, which makes us unique in a lot of ways. Um, I got, yeah, I have to say, I mean, I went to the Raptor Center for the first time, but maybe two years ago. And um, it was it was a really great time. I don't know a whole lot about bird beyond just like okay, I hear them chirping, and I I think I know what a cardinal looks like from you know an eagle, <laughs> you know through sports probably. But um, but I'll say this: I do remember one program, and you know, and I think it was the one where we were talking about vultures. And I think that you know I have a common you know just common regular person can say well vultures are bad, right? Because they're always seen in the media as just. You know, a bad person is usually, oh, you know, these capitalist vultures or something like that. It's always, you know, it's usually not a very good, uh, you know, a good thing. But I remember one pre- the front presentation. I remember we're sitting in a little stage, and and you bring out some vault. They bring out some vultures, and you know, just birds of prey, and and they, you know, you learn that they actually do so much for society. You know, all that roadkill that is just nasty and is obviously just, de- de- you know, like biodegrading there and things are happening. They take care of that. I mean, they, they serve an actual real purpose. And like, like you said, they're extremely smart. Like they, they would fly over your head and, and they would go to where they needed to go. I mean, they were um, a lot smarter than most of our airlines. To be honest. <laughs> Many respects. Um, and so if you haven't been, you should really check out, um, you know, the, the Raptor Center. And I guess what I, the reason I say you may want to check it out in its current situation because there's some changes happening here. Um, you mentioned that they're now almost, I guess, concurrent two campuses with uh, now going. You have the Raptor Center, I guess the original Raptor Center, and now we've got something called Quest. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about Quest and how did Quest come about? Well, and we and, and back to the current campus, we are open now seven days a week again. We were closed. Mm-hmm. We've had sort of with the pandemic, we were closed for three months and then we opened to the public again in July of last year, very sort of uh, condensed hours and everything and masking and all that. But as of uh, Memorial Day weekend, we're back seven days a week. We still have a morning and afternoon session that folks can come out. We ask that folks register online, new birds to see. Mm-hmm. Um, not as much masking or that. So we are open for folks to come out and enjoy. Quest started as a dream with Park and Rec back in 2006, uh, almost my third month on the job. We started having conversations and the county realized that they needed more space at their old nature center here in Atlanta. We had needed more indoor space and gift shop space and classroom space. And so we were able to put on the ballot in 2008, part of the countywide bond referendum. It passed unanimously to be able to, to get money to do all these projects. And then the economy imploded, so we weren't able mm-hmm. to do it. We started conversation back with the county, I guess about six or seven years ago, to see if this would be reality. And we realized early on it was the way that we needed to go because the county wanted to build this beautiful new interpretive center, wanted us to partner with them. Uh, and we said, absolutely. And so we have been working with them for years. It took us about a year to actually pick the location where Quest will be. And if you're familiar with the current center, you know you come down Sample Road, used to go up to the old gates. Well, now there's a brand new gate, monument gate that brings you into Lata Nature Preserve. Quest is the new facility just on your right. And it's a joint venture between us uh, and Mecklenburg County. We're partners in this and hence the, the name really evokes the partnership uh, because both of us will be operating and managing this new facility. Indoor exhibit space, beautiful space. It's gonna talk about nothing survives without water, the importance of water. 
Uh, a lot of folks don't know that Mountain Island Lake is the drinking source for the city of Charlotte. Uh, mm. The Tidal River system was man-made a lot of it for power uh, generation and for drinking. And so it talks about that story, hands-on activities you can do. There's still the old, um, you're going to see some snakes, you're going to see some turtles, but they're in much better enclosures. Visit, uh, like you saw, a classroom space, unbelievable mm -hmm. space, conference room space, both for us, Park and Rec, and for the for corporations or nonprofits can rent the catering kitchen. So just a beautiful new campus that we were able to design. We broke ground on it, I guess, almost three years ago. We were hoping we would have opened it uh, late 19, early 2020. Construction pushed us over into 2020, and then COVID hit. And so we really had to delay the opening, and we're still not open to the public. I'm, I'm in my office in Quest. There's a, a camp going on for Park and Rec. But we hope, keeping our fingers crossed, that we will be able to open uh, in some fashion to the public here in the next month or so. We're just sort of working with the county on an operational plan. Check out our Facebook page, our Twitter uh, website. We'll be promoting it as well as the county will. Uh, and then we will operate, as, as Rocky, you said, two campuses. So we're building behind me. You can't really see out my window, but out the back will be our new Raptor public campus. So the Duke Energy Amphitheater will be there. Um, our new outdoor pavilion classroom will be there. Uh, our bird wellness and urgent care center for the resident birds. There'll be 40 new raptor enclosures on about a mile of trail back behind me. And so everything public will move from just down Sample Road back to here. And then we will convert a portion of our current 57 acres to medical. Uh, and so the medical campus will be able to, to kind of grow a little bit. So all of that's in, uh, in works now. We're still in construction behind us. There's an enclosure back there. We've got the Duke Energy Amphitheater we'll start working on. Um, and so I would think, you know, in a year, a year and a half, when people come to Quest, they would see everything. Right now, if you come out here, when we open to the public, you'll be able to go in our visitor center, gift shop. You'll be able to experience the Quest uh, facility activities and all of that and then just drive right down the road to the current center where you'd see the birds on display the birds in programs and all of that so it's kind so, of so when so we, we got quest and we have like sort of the 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 original raptor center when everything is operational quest what will be going on at the at the original raptor that will be all medical or is some of that yeah. being given back to the county or what, what no well, part of it may go back to the county some of the back part of the trail that we don't know mm -hmm. how to use. but once we've moved our entire public piece out here wow. then the current campus will be medical focused right will you be able to expand i guess the service to to birds then i guess if the whole thing is for we hope we hope we'll be able to expand and actually make life easier on our staff right, right yeah. now if you've been to our current medical center surgeries upstairs lab mm -hmm. X-ray, radiographs, all that's downstairs. Staff have to run up and down the stairs with birds and treatment. We'll move that over to our existing visitor center. It'll all be on one ground floor. We'll be able to have some better equipment. We'll be able to use our, our existing medical center for overflow patients, staff offices, um, and some of the enclosure that we have over on the public side. We will retrofit them to become rehab or medical enclosure. So it gives the, it gives the medical team more tools to be able to do their job. And as the public comes out here, you'll see birds in enclosures that make it a much better engagement for the public. It'll be easier to see the birds, the quality of life for the birds will be better. Um, the trail will be all handicap accessible as it's been on our current trail. You know, it's just a meandering trail through the woods. The trail out here is nice packed, be really looking good for everything. Um, and so we're, we're very excited about what the future holds for us. We are still in capital campaign. I think it's, yeah. the nonprofits are, you're almost in perpetual capital campaign, but we're, we're still mm -hmm. continuing to raise money to finish out part of our trail system. Well, speaking of financial, we do have a question in the chat. Um, and he's asked, uh, Barbara asked, what is the year over year financial growth over the last three years? That sounds like a 990 question. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, Honestly, we've remained flat uh, in some aspects. We were growing a little bit until COVID hit. And I think, if you just, to be honest with you, we got hammered. I think most folks did. We saw the, phys the last quarter of physical uh, 20 for us, which would have been, you know, about 2019, 
I can't remember what years they are anymore. It would have been fiscal 20, um, which would have been April, May, and June. We almost saw zero revenue, right? We had no no admissions. That's our biggest mm-hmm. time of the year, the latter part of the year. Uh, we didn't, weren't able to have our big uh, in-person town of the table fundraiser, which nets about $100,000 a year. Programs were non-existent. Schools were just all canceled, so they were out. So I think that last quarter, we lost about $300,000 plus. Thousand dollars. Mm. Same considering we're about a $1.2 million budget. But uh, fortunately, we were able to get PPP funding. We were able to get some CARES Act funding, which able to allow us to do that. Um, we were anticipating a substantial growth, Barbara, with your question, because of Quest, right? Being able to have uh, better admission, uh, better features, driving some generated income in a couple of different ways. We were not able to do that. So we're really hopeful, uh, mm-hmm. was the 22, that some of our generated revenue model will be able to be executed and be able to kick in. So, but year over year, we just be honest with you, we've been happy to stay flat. Um, mm-hmm. we didn't have to release any staff. Uh, we were able to continue operations. Um, it's just going to see what Quest will allow us to do. Is bring in more. Okay. Now, so we got another question here in the uh, chat from Donnie, and would like to know how has the Raptor Center handled volunteers during this time? And I imagine because of COVID and kind of come out of COVID time. Yeah, Donnie, that's a great question. So I'll give you sort of the we have about two hundred plus volunteers. I mean, that's that's active, working in some regular shift or fashion. Now you put on top of that about another thousand a year that are corporate, right? major corporations. Schools mm-hmm. have come out with lots of volunteers. And so the sort of the episodic, the done in the day projects. Um, yeah. On March the 18th, that all went away. All of our volunteer corps was gone. We closed completely to the volunteer. But as we tell folks, we were still open. You know, we were closed to the public, but we were still open seven days a week because we had hundreds of animals to care for. So mm-hmm. staff had to pick up that load. And we're a staff, normally not seasonal, but our regular staff is about 20 staff. So 20 staff had to take care of everything. So our staff that were in business services, since we weren't open to the public, shifted over and helped with bird care. All of us were helping with bird care in some shape or form during those months because we didn't have feeding, closures being cleaned, all of our docents. And so back in the summer last year, about, about 11, 12 months ago, we started bringing a few volunteers back, but not nearly the manpower that we needed. Uh, some of our docents, our interpretive volunteers, are just now coming back. They feel comfortable, so we're able to engage the public more. But it's it's been well over a year, and we're still down a number of volunteers. Our, our corporate groups really didn't start coming back until the spring. So we went, you know, 13, 14 months without these big groups. And I truly want to let I want to lift up our property manager, Ernie. He's a one man show. And it's volunteers that help him maintain two major buildings, hundreds of uh, enclosures, you know, a couple miles worth of trails, 57 acres. Uh, he really relies heavily on these volunteer groups. He's, you know, Bank of America or Wells Fargo or Fifth Third or this school or that corporation. To come out and bring 20 or 30 volunteers, that all stopped. And so now they're starting to come back and help us with trail maintenance and renovations. And we just had our first couple of weeks ago equitable was one of our first corporate groups to come back and do work for us. So we're starting to see it. Um, but no, we, without volunteers, was a struggle, true struggle. I think it it created the opportunity for staff to really realize how they take it. I think landed our volunteers, right? So when you're not having to do all the work the volunteers do, uh, all of a sudden staff had to step in do their normal work and do everything else that our well, here's a question. So, I mean, obviously, we are reopening in touch, and we've got some folks here who might be connected to some HR or corporate staff. I mean, if, if uh, folks want to volunteer, whether they're individuals or from, uh, you know, from, from businesses who are looking to kind of, like, create more team building, HR sort of uh, aspect, um, how can they reach uh, the, the Raptor Center? Do you have to get on a list? Do you need to fill out an application? What, how does that process work? All of the above. So if you go on our website, 
<laughs> up top, there's some, a little tab that says volunteer. You go in there and it gives you all the opportunities, whether you're an individual adult, uh, corporate group, you just kind of click on it. If you're an individual and you want to know what opportunities are there, you go, hey, I want to work directly with birds. I want to be a duck. I want to do this. There's like a job description. It tells you if that position's open or not. Uh, Audrey Blackburn is our community engagement manager and volunteerism falls under her. She'll interview folks, um, see if you're the right fit, are we the right fit for you, are you the right fit for us? And then you're assigned a department to work with. Doing that now. Uh, school groups, church groups, uh, scouts, corporate groups also work through Audrey and she schedules out our um, group work days. Works with you on that. So we are accepting groups again. Now, I will say, though, even during COVID, some groups were doing virtual volunteerism. And if you mm. ask, did this ever work? I'd say, well, how are they going to volunteer virtually when they can't do? But what we do is a lot of things that we need for the birds. Enrichment is one. We need folks to create these enrichment activities. So Audrey's done these huge, she did one for Bank of America. It was probably 100 and something plus people that were on a Zoom call making enrichment at home. She sent this list of materials you'll need. Here's the thing I can do, the craft, basically. And then when they were done, we got them all and we were putting them out to our birds. And so there are ways that you can connect and work with us without having to physically be here. Um, there's, it's all on our website. We want folks to come. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting how much uh, volunteers really make up the, the Raptor Center. And it kind of makes you feel like, you know, this is this is our Raptor Center. You know, it's, it's, it's not just... You know, just I mean, it's, it is a nonprofit, but really, ultimately, you know, it's a community-based organization. You know, and it's um, and, it, and it's amazing how much uh, you know community support from through volunteers, through obviously donations, through attending fundraisers, through just being a patron, right? You know, just just being a part of it and having that you know that sort of that sort of ownership and that sort of support. Um, so obviously, you know, I think like speaking of like support, you had mentioned that. You know that that you had received or continue to receive, you know, funding from the Arts and Science Council. Now I know that definitely that term. I, I said one term that kind of has loaded connotation, and as of late, you know, another uh, organization which used to not have the connotation tends to have a connotation is the Arts and, and Science Council. Now we're obviously not in any position to talk about arts funding in Charlotte. You know, I, you know, and that's a loaded uh, topic and. That's for another time, and and I may need you know some plexiglass and some you know to kind of protect myself from whatever goes back and forth you know during uh, during that particular conversation. But but you, but you hear the name; it's it's Arts and Science Council, right? And so I kind of want to know a little bit, not necessarily about that particular, although obviously a jumping board is that particular organization's funding of science. But I want to kind of talk about that organization, but then just about science funding or support for science. I know we, we'll have a conversation about support for the arts um, the, much later. It's been, I, I hear it all the time in WFAE anyway. So, but what about support for um, nonprofits, uh, organizations focused on science? So obviously Raptor Center is one. I would assume maybe Discovery Place would probably be something similar, but what is the environment for those in the nonprofit sector and the social sector related with science or science adjacent type of missions. Well, and thank you for bringing that up. And we are, we're very grateful to be a part of the Arts and Science Council. And we all know that that's changing uh, with some of the- Maybe we change it to arts, I mean, science and arts council, and maybe we probably wouldn't have all the- well, <laughs> and, and, we're, and we're very grateful. Don't, I always like to tell folks, I always want to lead that we're extremely grateful for the funding we receive, right? We earn it, uh, we don't take it for granted. We know that folks could cut funding in point um, and we think that we do and make an impact so we can show the metrics that make it worthwhile we're showing a return on investment particularly with science um, mm -hmm. but a lot of the, a lot of the conversations that have been occurring recently are about arts mm -hmm. we get in there, but it's about the arts and as you mentioned us discovery place both discovery place nature you know the old nature museum discovery place science the, the bigger the, the flagship downtown discovery place kids up in huntersville also mm -hmm. Carolina's Aviation Museum, right? It's mm. not the history of aircraft, but a lot of the science about flight. We're really the science groups in town that were part of ASC. 
uh, will be part of this new model that the city of Charlotte has rolled out in conjunction with the Foundation for the Carolinas. At least for the first year, we will be receiving funding. But as I always like to hear, and I sort of, I cringe when it's all about the arts. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we could very easily say that we're the arts too. Right? We have beautiful birds. We do mm -hmm. photo wild. We have artists that come out. But really for what we see is the need for STEM too. Um, mm -hmm. And the argument keeps being for economic development. Well, if you look at STEM-based jobs, which just STEM quality of life. You know, I grab my cell phone uh, or this call that we're doing doing now and being able to use Zoom and the technology that we use, less science. You know, if you go to some of, if you go to a performance and, and you go to see a live performance or a recorded performance uh, or a visual like Van Gogh, right? The new uh, interactive digital Van Gogh, that's science. And so how does that inspire people? We like to say that the science side of the culture piece ignite a passion for science. You know, kids need to be able to be engaged in science and it's not happening in school we can prove that it's happening in museum settings or those field trips they take or that summer day camp they went to um it's that parent taking them to discovery places it's that parent bringing them to the raptor center or the aviation museum or going to the zoo or, or stowe botanical gardens all these different organizations that they become curious about what's going on in the world Science isn't just about numbers. It's not about experiments that you learn in school. It's everyday life. Um, and we need to be prepared for that, particularly moving forward. And I'm the dinosaur on the call. You can look at my gray hair and my wrinkles, but I've learned to adapt to technology. Right? I'm using my phone for different things. Think about this. When I was in college, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't even have computers. It was the old go to the mainframe system. I now have more processing power on my phone than they had at NASA back years ago. And so we have to learn how to harness that. Not if you even just want to go in a science career, but just everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. The digital platform that we're living in, this digital virtual world. And so we think that the science piece of that is, is critical. And jobs, right? You look at a lot of the organizations coming into Charlotte, the FinTech, so to speak, mm -hmm. it's science. Um, and so we are that economic driver. But I think sometimes we get lost in the conversation. Arts are important. Trust mm -hmm. me, I'm a patron of the arts. We went to, um, I'm going to the Charlotte Symphony that's coming Friday at Truist Field that's to see the, the, hear the music and the fireworks. Yeah. Uh, we're going to the Van Gogh exhibit. You know, we had Midsummer Night's Dream with Theater Charlotte out at the Raptor Center a couple weeks ago. So. Art is great, but just don't forget the science. And I think even when you get to the state level through some of the state funding, again, arts, 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 the science component mm -hmm. is, is not there. And so my job is to advocate locally to make sure mm -hmm. the science, just as, as uh, Catherine Horn at Discovery Place or Steve Saucier at the, the Aviation Museum, our job is to continue to lift up our voice about science at the state that science is crucial, um, science is a part, science is, is not just a cruel destination, but mm -hmm. truly it can. And trust me, I've talked to the city council, I've talked to the county commission, I've talked to funders, and they, they're, they're getting it, but it's just that when you think funding model now, mm -hmm. really gravitating towards more. Um, science is an art, right? It's an art. Well, you know, it, it's funny because in some respects, you know, like when you say term like, I mean, I'm going to lead into something else, you know, like the Arts and Science Council, or Arts and Science, it shouldn't be anything controversial to hear those terms, right? So I'm going to go somewhere uh, somewhat tangential, but I, another institution or institutions that are somewhat controversial here in 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 Mecklenburg is is um, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools and and the county. And obviously, we're not going to go into that, and boy. I'm, gonna, I'm having my own plexiglass every time I'm like, you know, things are just flying back and forth. But but I, here's a question. Like, I mean, obviously there's an issue of funding and I'm not saying that you go there and say, hey, you want that 50 now? I should send some of that here. But I mean, given your budget and the amount of money that they're fighting over, you know, with CMS I mean, and the educational mission here, I mean, has there ever been a discussion with either the county or the CMS about some kind of so funding support, you know, for STEM, because you mentioned STEM and connecting that to organizations like the Raptor Center and Discovery Place that, well, if you're going to hold up 
that amount of money and your operating budget is, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not $50 million to sit there. Has there been any discussion about integrating to a certain extent? Now, obviously you're public to everybody, but at least to the extent that the Raptor Center is, is involved with the education of students enrolled in CMS, has there ever been any kind of partner besides the field trip? Besides the field, I mean something a little more intentional and with some some back from dollars behind it. There have been discussions, and even the field trip part, Rocky. Uh, mm -hmm. Years ago, we would see so many schools, you know, just constant flow of, of schools coming out on buses, um, or us putting birds in vans and going to them. And that was pretty much recurring. And then, just I guess over the last ten years, you've seen field trip opportunities diminish, transportation costs. Yeah, uh, there's there's no so time much more. Because they can't test for it, so they're, they're taking away from well, the Well, they've got to take time to, for testing. There's less chance for students to do things outside. At one point, not long ago, we had a contract with CMS to bring every first grader out here. 10,000 yeah. plus students a year were coming to the Raptor Center. That all ended. Uh, they just couldn't do it anymore. And so field trips really shifted from being a system-wide process to more mm -hmm. individual schools. We still mm -hmm. see some, but not nearly the way we did. Of course, with COVID, they all went away. We're not going to put mm -hmm. kids on a bus. We then can't even take birds to a school because they're very mm -hmm. sensitive to who's coming in. And so the field trip piece is one aspect of it. But yeah, you're right, the curriculum development. How do we get youth involved either through internships or other things? And we're still doing some of that. But yeah, it's, it's going to be an ongoing conversation and not mm -hmm. just with CMS, but at the state level with private schools. How do yeah. we to make sure that STEM science mm -hmm. um, is in the forefront? Yeah, because it seems to me that, I, I mean, I'm not, again, like you, like you said, I could, I could pretend that Raptor Center can hold itself as an art museum. You know, you can come paint a Raptor, you can come take a picture here, we may have a photography class here, but it almost sounds like it's a better fit in sort of the education, you know, uh, field and that area of funding versus having to compete with a, a history museum or, or obviously the plethora of, of art projects from obviously you said the symphony to the Levine to all of these other things that, that are, are there um, is, and that's an interesting, I almost want to have art science here just ask them, well, when did the science come in? When did you guys start, like, why, why'd you add them on there? What, wasn't it always just arts or something? Because sometimes it's about categorization and, and by categorization, you can kind of show where your priority is, right? Because sometimes it's like, well, you know, why are we kind of evaluated on these metrics when really, we're trying to do more of an educational metric, and to that regard, you know, and, and to, you know, plus, I mean, I, well, I guess there's controversy on the arts and museum funding thing. There's controversy now, I guess, in the education funding around here. So I guess you can't avoid that. But to to that regard, I, what I will say is that I think that um, from what I have gotten out of our conversations is number one, the Raptor Center is a a definite treasure to the Charlotte region. And, um, you know, it is our Raptor Center, you know, it, volunteers comprise a lot of it. Um, it is one of the places where it's a, such a unique treasure, just not just in the city of Charlotte, not just in the state of North Carolina, uh, really in the entire country, um, you know, and, and as Quest expands, that whole area will become probably the largest bird hospital in America. Would that be, I mean, based on patients and probably size at that point? And so it's something extremely, extremely important. And and for those of you, you know, out there, um, you know, and you know, is how can we support um, the Raptor Center? Well, we can donate online. I'll just be right up front. You know, if I'm, yeah. I wouldn't be the nonprofit exec if I didn't say that. But truly, just you know, come visit, uh, buy an annual pass, continue to. Let us know how we can better serve the community, both whether you're an individual or representing another nonprofit. We have a lot of nonprofit partners. We partner with mm -hmm. a lot of other groups to serve their communities, to do things together. Like we were, when Theater Charlotte had their um, auditorium burned down, right, recently, mm -hmm. they didn't have any places. So we were one of the venues where they could host uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. It was wonderful to see Shakespeare outside like that. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we are a partner with so many other different groups. We're not just a, an individual entity, but how can we be supported? Um, but again, if folks want to come out, see what we're doing with Quest, uh, we are definitely seeking capital campaign funds to get this project finished. And so if you got a million or two laying around you'd like to invest, well, give me a call tomorrow or actually call me this afternoon. I'll take that call right now. Um, it's, it's how we can continue to keep this organization. It is a gem, right? We are, we are one of those things that this community should be extremely proud of. We've had folks come from all over and say, well, how Charlotte? Why Charlotte? Well, again, you go back to some enterprising <laughs> folks at UNC Charlotte Charlotte years ago that just had the vision and the thoughtfulness to say, this is huge. It could be bigger. Um, and it is. And our partners with Mecklenburg County Park and Recreation. I can't go over again how close a relationship it is. Uh, when we built this building, we built it together. We, we have skin in the game. We've got financial stake in this venture. Um, and all of our corporate partners and everyone else, we could not do it without the community support. Uh, it just wouldn't work. Absolutely. So what's the website? Because I'll make the plug. Is it, is it www.carolinaraptorcenter.org? carolinaraptorcenter.org. I'm sure you just go find the Donate Now button. Obviously, they're a 501c3 public charity, so uh, individual and, and donations are tax deductible. So, you know, go ahead and get that done. But, you know, what the type of organization this is, you know, show up, buy a ticket, buy a couple of tickets. I plan on taking my family to the Raptor Center this summer now that I, well, I knew things are reopening, but you're always like, well, you know, let's make sure that we're here, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's time to get back to the business of being. Uh, no mask required. Yeah. Come out, enjoy the birds, see some birds again that you're not going to see hardly anywhere else uh, in the country at a zoo, much yeah. less you have to go to Africa or somewhere else. Um, just, and our staff, mm -hmm. the, the staff, the professional group that I work with and our board, Mm -hmm. I'm privileged and, and honored to work with this the dynamic group that I get a chance to work with every day. Who wouldn't want to come to work at Lab? I drive in down Sample Road, and I don't care what you have waiting on you. Mm -hmm. Stress level diminishes. This is a a island sanctuary in an urban environment, and people like to say, "Well, I feel like I'm out in the middle of nowhere in the mm -hmm. wild." That's the cool thing that this nature preserve provides. It's over 1,400 acres. Come to the Raptor Center, go fishing while you're here, make sure you got a license, but uh, you know, <laughs> sign up for one of Park and Rec's programs. There's just so much you can do out here in the planet. You can make it better. Absolutely. Well, we're getting towards the end of our hour here, so are there any uh, questions here? Well, we just, uh, well, thank you. You're welcome, Barbara. She's uh, just thank, thank you for time and information here. Um, and, um, well, if there are no questions left, uh, Jim, thank you for joining us here on the Leadership Series to learning more about uh, the Raptor Center and, and, and the new Quest. Uh, good luck with everything that's going on there and hope that uh, next time that obviously I'll, you know, come look for you when I, I come out to, uh, to the Raptor do. Center and, and Quest. And, and, of course, you know, for those out there, you know, support our, our Raptor Center. You know, I think it's an important, it's a, it, to me, it truly is a, a treasure. It's a gem that we have here in, in this part of our, in our, in our city, in our, our region. And, um, and yeah, and I think, and don't forget the science. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, people talk about STEM, but then what are you doing to kind of support STEM? I think it's almost like we just have these verbs or words that we like to use just because it sounds like that's kind of what you're supposed to say. But I mean, the proof's in the pudding. This is a new uh, quest and walk in there, there are classrooms there. So I, I, to me, and this is me on my little soapbox, I think the more that we can kind of steer organizations like Discovery Place and, and Raptor Center and not necessarily have to be in the, the arts kind of, you know, uh, funding world and bring them more to their traditional places where it's, it's a funding of you know, primary and secondary, and yes, even even post-secondary education. I mean, you've got the biggest hospital here. I mean, a lot of veterinary schools should be connecting here and and, and paying for their 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 students to 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 treat birds in in the largest bird hospital in America. You know, these are things that um that we really need to just kind of start to take advantage. I mean, because and and I think the I'll leave this is that if you know the story of the Raptor Center, it is the story of the possible. You know, it is, you've got, <laughs> you've got this underground 
bird hospital in some sort of basement of some science building at UNCC in the 70s. This isn't the new UNCC that you you know that we all like marvel at. I just I mean I know I don't have no clue what the 1970s UNCC, but I was a post box student there in the in the mid to late 90s, and it you know it, yeah it's it's not this UNCC. So yeah, the, the very humble beginnings to where you are now. Um, and, and, and this is our Raptor Center. So what we can do as a community to support it would be just fantastic. So anyway, um, we will be back in two weeks and we will be wading in a little bit into the arts and we'll have uh, M, uh, Wendy Hickey from Art Pop, very cool new um, 501c3 uh, arts based organization on. Um, and we'll talk about that great organization and also uh, to whatever extent we can without having things fly over our heads, you know, discuss the art funding situation here in the city of Charlotte. So until then, thank you for joining us and you all have a wonderful week and a great weekend and a, and a, and a wonderful fourth. Uh, have Thanks a everybody. happy Take care, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. Take care.